Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Museum of Arts and Design. Uh, I'm Chris Goes, the new director here at MAD, and I'm excited to welcome everyone to the opening event for the symposium, Shared Ground, Cross-Disciplinary Approaches to Craft Studies, made possible by the Wingate Foundation. In a few minutes, you're going to get to meet a number of esteemed scholars in the field, but first I'd like to take a moment to recognize a few special guests in the audience. First is MAD's board chair, Michelle Cullen. Former Vancic President of the Center for the Arts Craft Board of Directors. <laughs> Susan Weber, founder of BARD. <laughs> and I'm hoping one of our trustees, Laura Taft Polson, is here in the audience too. Laura just had surgery this week in her arm, but I don't know if she's here this evening. But thank you to Laura. So since the museum's founding in 1956 by philanthropist and visionary Eileen Osborne Webb, MAD has celebrated all facets of making and the creative processes by which materials are transformed from traditional techniques to cutting edge technologies. As many of you know, today's MAD's curatorial team builds upon a rich history of exhibitions that emphasize a cross-disciplinary approach to art and design and reveals the workmanship behind the objects and environments that shape our everyday lives. Based on that history, it was really a no-brainer that in the fall of 2014, thanks to the tremendous support of the Wingate Foundation, we, along with the Bar Graduate Center and the Center for Craft, initiated a transformational partnership that resulted in the creation of the Wingate Research Curator. This cross-organizational position united three prestigious institutions that have supported and expanded the field of craft studies in order to foster innovative research that could respond to the field's rapidly increasing current need to live the field of contemporary art. Drawn on the successful foundation laid by the Wingate Foundation Research Curator, this symposium presented by MAD, Bar Graduate Center, and the Center for Craft is one of the many outcomes of this great partnership. And so now I'd like to welcome to the podium Stephanie Moore, Executive Director for the Center of Craft for her remarks. Good evening, and thank you for that introduction, Chris. It is also my honor to welcome all of you to the first evening of the Shared Ground Symposium. For those of you who haven't I haven't had a chance to meet. I'm Stephanie Moore, Executive Director of the Center for Craft, and tonight we've come together to consider the prevalence of craft studies across disciplinary boundaries and identify where the opportunities lie for finding shared ground. This symposium is a testament to the growing number of scholars and programs dedicated to the study of craft. It is an accomplishment in and of itself to be gathered here for three days to share research ask questions, and make connections. I'd like to begin by thanking our partners, the Museum of Art and Design and Bard Graduate Center. The Center for Craft has worked with these two like-minded institutions to advance craft and craft studies for many, many years. Joint initiatives like the Wingate Research Curator and this symposium foster unique synergy between the academy and the museum, carving out new space for craft research. We are truly grateful to continue to work with such esteemed colleagues to build a future for the field of craft. On a personal note, it's been a pleasure to have this chance to meet Chris and all of you and to share this time together. It is so great to come together in a space where we are in person. Also, special congratulations to founder and director Susan Weber on celebrating the 25th anniversary of Bard Graduate Center. hearing more from Susan tomorrow morning about their Gallery Research Institute and MA and PhD programs. I'd also like to acknowledge several members of the Center for Crafts Board of Directors who are with us, Barbara Benish and Kathy Edelman who are in the audience tonight, and Brian Chernoff who will be joining us tomorrow, and acknowledge the generous support from the Wingate Foundation who provided us with this precious time and resources to begin these conversations. For over 20 years, the Center has worked to advance the understanding of craft in higher education, 
museums and cultural institutions and across disciplines in order to increase the value of craft to society. We provide grants to emerging and established craft artists, scholars and curators, organize an annual craft think tank, and host both exhibitions and programs in our gallery located in Asheville, North Carolina. And if you've ever wanted a chance to come to Asheville, now you have your excuse. When we first started our efforts in 1996, craft history and theory was rarely taught in a university setting. Today, there is now a thriving community of craft scholars, a dedicated textbook on the American studio craft, a peer-reviewed re journal, and most recently, a master's level program in critical and historical craft studies, all of which the center has played a key role in bringing to fruition. These accomplishments would not be possible without the ongoing support of the Center's Craft Research Fund, a visionary program dedicated to supporting scholarly craft research that has radically transformed the field as we know it. Since 2005, the Center has annually granted $95,000 to academic researchers, independent scholars, curators, and graduate students in writing, revising, and reclaiming the history of craft. In total, the center has distributed $1.2 million to over 150 scholars. In fact, over a third of the presenters here tonight have received grants through the Craft Research Fund. Thank you for coming out tonight, for attending this symposium in support of this very important occasion, continuing the work of defining and redefining the field of craft. This field would simply not exist without the curious minds and sharp intellect of the people who are with us tonight. It is now my pleasure to introduce the organizers behind the event and also thank them profusely for the hours of dedication that made today possible. Catherine Whalen, Associate Professor at Bard Graduate Center, Marilyn Zapp, Assistant Director and Curator of the Center for Craft, and Alyssa Author, Wingate Research Curator at the Museum of Arts and Design and Visiting Associate Professor at Bard Graduate Center. among six prominent scholars in the field who explore craft across multiple fields, including anthropology, art history, decorative arts, design, and science and technology studies. The moderator of this keynote discussion is Ned Cook, distinguished professor of art history at Yale. The panelists are Namita Wiggers of Warren Wilson College, Mahmoud Keshavarez of Uppsala University, Alicia Di Nicola at Emory, Steve Jackson at Cornell, and independent scholar Adrian Child. As members of our symposium planning group, they have been instrumental in providing intellectual and guidance and outreach in the planning of the symposium. They'll also moderate pan panels tomorrow at Bard Graduate Center, where they'll make connections and foster conversations across the symposium. Panel presentations tomorrow are organized as follows. Blurring and crossing examines how craft moves across and changes 
uh, in geography, depending on geography, disciplinary affiliation, and cultural borders. Making a building explores the expanding identities and ideologies of craft and craft people. Naming and claiming addresses how definitions and parameters of craft, craft practice impact communities of makers. Tomorrow's program also includes an interactive session featuring 11 poster presentations, presenting new research in the field, uh, and asking new questions. Thanks, Catherine. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Elisa Author. On Saturday, we'll be back here at MAD to explore how these new approaches to craft studies map onto curatorial and pedagogical practices. We will hear case studies from museums and universities, tour some of the recent exhibitions, and end the day with a working session digging into what, where, and how craft histories are taught. Um, before we begin with tonight's keynote panel, a, a few additional thanks are in order. First, I want to join um, Chris and Stephanie in thanking the Wingate Foundation for their ongoing support of the field, including the position of the Wingate Research Curator and the sponsorship of the symposium. We'd also like to thank, thank Chris Goetz, Stephanie Moore, and Susan Weber for their leadership and support, and to our working group. Adrian, Manu, Steve, Alicia, and Anita. Their insights have been invaluable and expanded our own thinking and approach to these events. In addition, thanks in advance to the speakers and poster presenters for sharing their research with us and for pushing the geographic, temporal, and conceptual limits of craft. Thanks also to Laura Minsky at Bar Graduate Center, Lauren Rockmore at the Center for Craft, and Arzu Hansen, Danny Orndorff, Lydia Bronner, and Dun Duncan Cutler here at MAD. Their administrative and technical support and acumen has made the symposium possible, and for that we are very, very grateful. It is now my pleasure to introduce the moderator for tonight's keynote discussion, who will in turn introduce you to our working group. Edward Cook, Jr. is a Charles F. Montgomery Professor of American Decorative Arts in the Department of the History of Art at Yale University. He has written widely on historical and contemporary American material culture and decorative arts, is currently finishing a study on the self-invention of Boston in the period 1680 to 1720, as well as a book on material culture um, in a global perspective. He holds a BA from Yale College, MA in Early American Culture from the Winchester Program at the, of the University of Delaware, and a PhD in American Studies from Boston University. But before we welcome Ned to the stage, I just want to, there's a few items, um, housekeeping items. Following the keynote discussion, there will be a reception on the seventh floor of the museum hosted by the Center for Craft, and you can reach the seventh floor by the elevator or stairs. The galleries at MAD are open tonight until 9 p.m. You just need your blue button uh, to enter the galleries, and the coat check will close at 10 p.m. Our discussion will be live streamed this evening, so hello to anyone who's joining us virtually. And please feel free to capture favorite quotes and images on social media using the hashtag SharedGround2018. Now, please join me in welcoming Ned Cook to the stage. Thanks very much, Elisa. Um, and thank you all for the invitation to participate um, in this. And it, it just seems to me that we're at one of those um, propitious moments um, where there's been sort of some critical um, thinking energy um, that has really started to coalesce, that is starting to spin out. I was going to use a hurricane metaphor, but that's not appropriate um, <laughs> about it. But, but certainly, you know, what we're at is this whole time in which it seems to me we're moving beyond the types of um, paradigms that have existed for much of um, earlier craft uh, history and craft studies, you know, moving beyond the idea of mythical narratives of um, you know, the idea that um, self-employed, uh, single person sort of working in a Mauritian way, um, we're moving beyond sort of uh, the hagiographical notion about the heroic craftsman struggling against technology, struggling against um, corporate uh, capitalism, any number of different things. Um, the promotional aesthetic, that people were really sort of looking at objects uh, only from the point of view of, sort of dollar signs, uh, saleability. And to me, as I start to think about the way that this uh, symposium has been organized, what I start to do is see a kind of a Venn diagram um, in which there are this field of 
craft studies um, that's now broadly considered with many different fields overlapping in terms of their interests, fields that are based in one field, one discipline, one set of questions, but finding this idea of common ground, of shared um, ground. As they start to explore objects, not simply as idealized aesthetic types, um, but as situational sorts of things that grow out of particular contexts that are fluid uh, in some respects, um, to thinking about conception and production, not simply from some sort of a uh, evolutionary status of thinking about what's more value, it's got to be all handcrafted, uh, handmade. Um, if it's any sort of machine, it's bad. Um, but there's this way in which skill can be applied in so many different ways. Collaboration, it's not an individual um, who's at work on a particular object. And then ultimately that's where a lot of the traditional studies have stopped. The object, the maker. But there's a much greater consideration now that people are concerned with issues dealing with not just consumption, but also circulation. Um, how objects are then deployed in terms of trying to reinforce certain things, uh, trying to uh, articulate uh, points of views, that actually there is a way in which uh, objects can have uh, a much broader kind of impact than simply aesthetic pleasure put on a shelf, uh, put in a cabinet. And it's this whole idea of if I can borrow a, a phrase from um, the University of Chicago Journal, this idea of critical inquiry um, that is not necessarily critique in terms of a studio art program, but critical inquiry in which you're really trying to unwrap an object. Um, and what craft studies really oftentimes uh, enables is this notion about either from the inside out or from the outside in, but this way that is not simply going in one directional, but actually so it goes back and forth, that you come up with several different ideas about context, about production, and then an object might actually start to reveal certain things, it might be evidence, but it also might spawn other ideas that force you to go back out. Um, think about context, think about theories that you're applying, and you might have to shift around a little bit, and it's that in and out um, that I think dealing with uh, sort of more of a craft studies approach, you can start to use oral history, you can start to use much richer sorts of contextual um, points, and you can borrow theoretical perspectives from a number of different fields. And to me, that's the, the beauty uh, for this evening, is that thinking about um, having a panel with people who sort of represent um, different points of view. And just to sort of um, think about who is going to be up here, um, and then um, I'll have them all come up. And I've asked each of them to sort of just talk for five minutes about where they approach, how they might define craft, how they're approaching um, this particular uh, sort of subject as a way of starting things going. And then I'll start um, asking some questions, um, and eventually we'll end up um, taking some audience questions um, as well. So. Adrian um, is somebody who comes at it from the point of view of uh, a more, uh, some might say, more traditional art historian, somebody who's interested in um, the way in which appearance objects um, might be considered sort of style, um, but it's more than just sort of connoisseurship, it's more than simply plugging it into a series of progressive styles. What she's interested in is what's behind that appearance, not just simply taking it face value, uh, but actually saying, what are the politics involved in representation um, and embodiment? And so therefore, she shifts it away from that notion of just thinking about uh, an object sort of emerging from a, uh, a designer's mind, but actually thinking about what's the reception and meaning? How do these objects play amongst many different audiences? Thinking particularly about um, the uh, Blackmore figure on ceramics, uh, for instance, in the 18th century. Namita is somebody who comes out of a, uh, a background um, that is also might be considered art history, but actually what she's most interested in is um, what you might think of knowledge structure. How is it that we construct uh, knowledge, a history of knowledge development, in this case, thinking about how do we know about the field of craft? How do we build cumulatively towards these things? And what biases are implicit um, as we construct that knowledge? Is my knowledge the same as Catherine's knowledge about this? Is our background going to account for something different? What we read, what we approach, 
the fact is that there are multiple uh, ways of approaching this and trying to have some sort of a historiographical sense as well as a sense of terrain is a very helpful um, sort of endeavor. So you might see the way in which your work could be put under the label of some form of sort of a post-colonial theory that is sort of to get away from the way in which knowledge is moving out from a center, um, in this case, sort of the traditional way of, of thinking about craft and who articulated it, who really uh, owned it, and then thinking about, well, who's left out uh, from that? Can we reverse uh, some of that uh, kind of uh, motion? We might think about Mahmoud, um, who's taking a more of a social science uh, approach um, to this particular subject, who's interested not simply in the object itself, but what, is, what does it tell you, how does it illustrate, how does it enact upon um, artifact, artifactual relations and practices. Um, I was really quite taken by a piece he did on the passport um, and the idea of passporting. How do you take something that's both a noun and a participle, actually slippering, um, in terms of uh, thinking about the ways in which uh, an object um, can exist um, as both sort of a, a design uh, that is a decision as well as a direction that prompts uh, that kind of behavior, the way many different uh, sociologists have talked about objects in terms of articulating uh, their lives. And, the ways in which you can sort of take that notion about object and practice and thinking about something as simple as a chair and chair nets, um, which is not an assumed sort of uh, cultural construct in many different uh, cultures who are ground cultures as opposed to chair cultures. And so the idea of thinking about everyday objects, not just a passport and what that does to control the body, um, to uh, keep different uh, things lined up in different place, the chair does the same thing. Um, it's hierarchy, um, it assumes uh, certain kinds of um, options uh, for people. You might think about Steve also sort of coming from um, not just sort of uh, science and technology studies, but um, some of his interest in um, human-computer uh, interaction, uh, thinking about uh, the way in which, how does uh, computation uh, and computation services in a post-digital age really come to grips with, um, you know, oftentimes put intention and opposition to craft, when in fact many uh, developments have uh, come even before uh, computer-assisted uh, kinds of work, that oftentimes the innovators are the people who want to eliminate the drudgery, um, who want to eliminate the stuff so they can get onto the creative part or onto the part that they could add money to or, you know, an apprentice is nothing more than another kind of a CNC uh, in some respects um, in an older kind of tradition. Um, it's a, it puts a different spin on these things, but I think asking those questions from a different perspective leads to productive kinds of uh, leaps forward. And then um, thinking about um, Alicia's work in ethnography um, and the ways in which oral history uh, of interviewing people with a perspective, not necessarily just recording somebody for uh, the sake of um, documenting um, something, but actually talking to somebody with a set of questions to try to see what you can understand about things like the hierarchies of values, of what value is uh, for different uh, sorts of objects for different sorts of people. Is the value that a maker puts into an object different than the value that a consumer does. Um, or to put it another way, um, thinking about, uh, as she did in her work in uh, South Asia, thinking about the relationship of designers, class uh, division between designers and craftspeople um, in the ways in which it isn't simply class, but how is the how is there a burden of class? How is tradition a burden rather than a celebration, um, which we tend to had done in the 1950s and uh, in 1960s. So for me, you know, she starts to get into issues of authorship, um, of um, expertise, uh, of the ways in which everything is constantly negotiated, um, and negotiated in different spheres, that what's being uh, negotiated on the, um, the block printing floor in Bagru is very different than what's being sold in Mumbai, um, or even in Jaipur, um, for that matter. Um, so that 
different people control different parts of the story, as it were. And the, the work of an ethnographer, in some respects, is to um, start to piece some of that together, um, rather than just relying on one voice and one voice only. So what I'd like to do now is invite um, the five of you up here, um, and then maybe have uh, each of you talk for five minutes, you know, uh, and then what I'm going to do is start asking some questions based on that, um, and have you get in conversation with each other, um, and let's see where we go. So come on up. So Steve, maybe what we'll do is start at your end and work towards it. Okay. Okay, well, I feel like I might be the oddball here, so I, this could be a There's no such interesting thing. <laughs> um, so I guess to give a sense of, of my background and where I come into these discussions, I'm trained in the interdisciplinary field of science and technology studies, which, for those of you who don't know, it's basically committed to understanding contemporary science and technology as both ordinary and material forms of work. Beyond the stories that are told of the sciences, how can you actually understand what those practices look like? And at the same time, I'm also professor and chair of the Information Science Department at Cornell. So we put these two things together. What that means is that I think like an SDS scholar, and the things that I think about are mostly computational in nature. And I think that's kind of an interesting entry point into some of these discussions because of the way that we've often told or imagined the story about computing and its relationship to craft and craft-like practices uh, as an oppositional one, right? We imagine computation as being the opposite of craft, or the stories we tell about computation tend to call out dimensions of that work uh, which neglect what I'm going to try and convince you are, are in fact, inherently craft-like uh, elements. Uh, the computing industry and computer, computer scientists are, are guilty of this as well in the stories we tell about computing, precisely because the way we tell the story of computing neglects all those elements, right? We, when we think about who is a computer scientist, what is a computer, the figure that usually comes to mind is some kind of Diet Coke addled programmer <laughs> in Silicon Valley. <laughs> Right? That's what we think about when we think about a computer, a, a compute computational worker, or maybe it's a technopreneur in Silicon Valley. So the way that world appears in our stories, and computer scientists are, are uh, culpable for this in part, is, a, is as a faceless and bloodless world. It's a world of digits like zeros and ones, but not digits like these, like our fingers. Uh, and all of our metaphors, the cloud, big data, et cetera, conspire in this story. But in my research and also my teaching and work with students, that's actually not the world of computing IoT for the most part. This might be a selection bias, I'll tell you in a minute about what I work on, uh, but the world of computing I see is actually full of craft, and some of its richest and most interesting, and for me, deepest dimensions are in fact craft-like in nature. Uh, and I think that many of the most interesting challenges and questions that arise in the field of computing today are precisely at the, those places where computing meets, mixes with, reconfigures, is reconfigured by its encounter with traditions of work which have very deep craft-like dimensions. Okay, so what am I actually talking about? What do I study? Um, I'll give you some examples of this. One of the projects uh, that I've, I've worked on for many years, and Marilyn has, has heard me talk about this in the past, uh, is cell phone repair uh, around the world, actually. But the, the cases I'm thinking about most immediately tonight are in Bangladesh. Um, this is a classic example of a story or a side of computing which most of you likely have never really thought about or have never heard about because of this Diet Coke cattle programmer problem that I just mentioned in the stories we tell. If you actually look at the work that keeps computing going in the world, that actually makes computing sustainable through vast swaths of the world, uh, including but not limited to places outside of North America and Europe, it's actually a deeply craft-like affair. If you go and spend time in the workshops in the Gulistan underground market and different places where this work happens, you would be struck, you would be astounded, I think, uh, at the creativity and innovation in the way I want to think about it. Um, and, and also craft-like nature of what's happening. Um, another example, places where computation meets ecology. One of the things I work on is a large-scale science project called the National Ecological Observatory Network. And one of the most striking features of that work is 
the, the tension that happens occurs when computational forms and data forms meet the exigencies and the deep, uh, deeply field grounded practices of ecology. Um, and my favorite, my, this is a, just a conflict story. My favorite quote from that work is from uh, uh, an ecologist who gave me this wonderful line that summed it all up. I went into nature, I went into ecology to be in nature, and now I sit all day at my fucking computer. <laughs> so there are tensions to this. Uh, there are other interest, interesting mixes, and I'll just call your attention to uh, a couple of examples, past and current projects, with my wonderful graduate student, Amy Cheadle, is back, Amy can win. Uh, we've been doing uh, work on robotic surgery and understanding how robots interface with the deeply, again, deeply craft-like nature of surgery and what that does to the identity of various members of the surgical team. Uh, Amy has led very interesting work that has a mad connection, actually, uh, on the introduction of robotics into Wendell Castle's uh, fine arts furniture production uh, that issued a, a, an installation of which issued here uh, last year, I guess, in the Wendell Castle Remastered Project. So, if we're thinking across these examples, what does craft mean and look like in these worlds? Again, these partial worlds that I look at. Um, if I were to try for a definition, which I wouldn't because I don't feel qualified to offer one, um, what I would say is that my interest in craft is really more about a practice and an orientation than an object. That's, that's how I actually approach many things in the world. Uh, and if I were to give some characteristics of that practice or orientation, it would probably include things like a form of material care and commitment, or a feel for the thing itself, a commitment to quality, whether aesthetic or functional, that is in some sense for its own sake, the elegance of a proper fix, a commitment to a job well done, a commitment to hand work and eye work and ear work and nose work and skin work and, and you know, filling your favorite body part perhaps, <laughs> Uh, uh, as a richly embodied attending to the worlds and things at hand. And also interestingly, in all of these interesting, uh, all these different sites that I've been looking at, I think there's very interesting questions around commitments to transmission, uh, often through forms of apprentice-like teaching and learning. So thoughtlessly applied, as it sometimes is, computing can indeed disrupt and undermine these relations and these values, but it just as often depends on them or extends them into new forms, to, to one of Ned's points. And in the core of its own work, despite the stories we tell about it, computing and modern science and technology in general, I believe, is a far more crafty endeavor than we've typically given it credit for. That's great, Steve. Um, one of the things that really uh, is striking is when you start to think about um, technological development in the 18th and early 19th century, for instance, it's oftentimes craftsmen who are generating it, they're the mechanics of the time who are the um, Steve Wozniak's of the time, um, who are fiddling around and figuring out ways to simplify certain things um, without a sense that eventually that could be co-opted and made into something other than the thoughtful work that they're engaged with um, in that product. So that notion of process-based uh, historical understanding of things, not being judgmental uh, as you approach it, but actually having a, an open mind and thinking that there are many different ways to walk around an issue or process and not to have a sense that one is more privileged uh, than another. Um, I mean, for me, it's, it's, it's a fascinating thing of thinking about where um, sort of computational work, which initially the first way in which it was introduced was in weaving. Um, in terms of the obviously binary uh, kinds of situations translated very well to um, the idea of web structure. Um, and how one thinks of thinking about uh, approaching Wendell or some other work, that it's very much um, a non uh, kind of rectilinear, um, that it's a much more curvilinear work, and how one can adapt um, those very same things. But yet, you can also start to thinking about 3D printing um, as that flexibility of either being a fascinating part of post-digital creation, or it can be mindless programming that which nobody understands the actual processes in it, or simply plug and play um, to produce something. So once again, you're caught in this good thing, but, but trying to open it up as much as possible. Adrian. And um, thank you for the wonderful introduction.
question. Um, I am a traditional art historian. Um, that wasn't said in a, in a negative way. No, no. <laughs> That's a hat I wear sometimes, too. <laughs> and that, that's how I was trained. And um, I'm really interested in 18th and 19th century European art and 20th century American art and the issues of race and representation across those axes. And um, as I was working on my you know, dissertation and all of that um, on painting and sculpture um, and images of black people in European art, um, I noticed that a great amount of um, objects, decorative objects, um, I think we're calling decorative art just part under the umbrella of craft here, because we can yeah. argue about that later. <laughs> it's stuff. They might, they might I like to say that. Anyway, there's so many decorative arts that were part anal analogous and analog to the paintings and sculptures. This was before mm -hmm. I we, we found before we, we started studying um, the ways that furniture and paintings and all of that work together in the environments. Uh, and so when I was in graduate school, there was really no discussion of these other kinds of objects. Um, they might be porcelain, they might be silver, they might be furniture. But I realized that they were sort of part of these ideas that were um, being communicated in the paintings. And so one of the things when I finished my project, which was my dissertation, hello, um, I, <laughs> the, one of the, when you finish something like that, you think, well, what am I gonna do with this material? The one thing that stood out was the, the decorative objects that had never been addressed in those kinds of ways. I mean, I, of course, you can do through going to research, you go to the book library, look for all the books on blacks and, and decorative art. So, of course, I'm still writing that one book right now. <laughs> um, there were none, there was nothing. Um, there, uh, so I, I took it upon myself to, to begin a long journey, and I've been on for about 10 years now, and I am just finished, starting to finish this book. But the main point is, I felt like these objects, which were sort of like tables, chair, uh, tables and chairs, silver candlesticks, black amore objects, uh, and the, the bodies are servants, they're slaves. Some of them are, have chains, so we know that they're slaves. They're holding lanterns. Um, in, in the early years in the 16th century, they're, they're precious uh, luxury objects, and they define luxury interiors, and they are part of the era of colonial um, pursuits, the era of the slave trade. And their Euro European luxury objects would define them at home, but reflect um, larger issues of inhumanity, or larger, you know, that, that are going on um, in this, let's say, triangular trade or in this Atlantic world. So how does this, the luxury material reflect that Atlantic world? And why hasn't anyone ever mentioned that when you go to the museum, or and, and I've even went, I've gone to talk to lots of uh, curators. I've been seen, I've seen a lot of these objects. I go to visit them, and often the curators, who are wonderful, they don't really know what to say about it. So it just isn't in there. So this is my big project. So how does that relate to anything? My quest, I, I run into a lot of questions when it comes to the issues of craft or the issues of decorative arts. A lot of the objects do have makers. The porcelains are really linked to to certain companies, but a lot of them have, they just mushroom up. They literally just appear in an inventory in the 7, 1677 inventory at Ham House. There are the, um, uh, the black and more objects appear and no one really knows where they came from. And they mushroomed up in Germany and they mushroomed in Italy and they think that they may have come from here. And so I, there's this kind of um, uh, swerve, this kind of uh, appearance of things that has to do with this, this, us not really understanding or knowing the history of that craft, the history of that trade, those workshops. Um, and so then what does it matter? So there's another question. Well, does it matter uh, who made them? Or what matters is maybe the collectivity of it and the ideas that they represent. So I'm kind of building an entire inquiry about a bunch of objects that I see as being related, and they are, uh, but have had no kind of systematic um, Analysis, a critical analysis, and so it's very, it's very hard. So one of the questions is, like, who, who made these, and does it matter, uh, or um, is there an origin story for this, <coughs> or what, what, the, why is it that um, some decorative arts are seen as in, in, inert, or in, or in other words, inert of meaning, or or benign, that just because um, there is some, it, it's there, it doesn't mean it has any meaning about black people, <laughs> or. Um, oh, my favorite is, um, it's so beautiful. Um, so what does beauty 
uh, or, and, and precious wooden precious objects and surfaces, <coughs> how, how do they obfuscate, especially when it comes to um, a, a decorative object, how do they obfuscate these very serious uh, issues? And the other part of this is the materiality, because um, it goes hand in hand. And there are some work being done on that. What does it mean when ebony is coming in from Africa? What does it mean when the ostrich feathers that you find in museums are coming in? <coughs> or the um, silver is coming in from um, uh, the South America um, that is being uh, mined by slave horse or something, then what, when it's fashioned into a slave horse. Or so those are the kinds of things. <coughs> There's both material things, there's this ideology, and then there's also, it's interesting, some of these objects are in the homes of people who are part of the trade or part of you know, the, the administration of these kinds of things. So then it's about um, the, how, does the, how do these decorative objects um, re reflect sort of phenomenological issues of being in the space and using them and having bodies around them. And there are a lot of decorative artists going through now starting to look at the social interplay between furniture and how they're being used. And then I'm just saying, well, how is race going, fitting in there? So this is a very complicated kind of um, inquiry. But uh, it, it, it's interesting to me, and it's kept me going for a long time in terms of you know, my interest. And I think that it, um, it says something about um, how the meaning of, of, of things and that they are not always, uh, I mean, that, that they need to be investigated um, you know, a little bit more when it comes to things like uh, social issues like race. That's powerful stuff because objects are not benign. Mm -hmm. they're, they're not um, just simply passive, that they do a lot of work. And some of it is on the form of hidden labor. Some of it is on presumed hierarchies mm -hmm. of the owner. Um, and just thinking about um, the history that you know, many times people have stopped only at the figures of the four continents. Mm -hmm. um, that's how they think about race being represented in 18th century ceramics. It's just a little garnitures mm -hmm. um, with the different colors of um, Asia, Africa, the Americas, yeah. and Europe. Um, and they feel like, okay, that's it. You know, it's typologies. Yeah. Um, and what they don't realize is that there are these other objects. Um, this this idea of othering. That I was really struck by, for instance, even uh, in silver from Australia in the mid 19th century, where the silversmiths um, are capturing uh, different kinds of flora and fauna, not just the kangaroos and the palms and things like that, but aboriginals that they patinate them so it, they are black and not silver. Um, and what that ultimately means in terms of trying to create um, these divisions um, and making them specimens. Also thinking about the hidden labor that you there's an object in the Yale Art Gallery um, it's a sugar bowl by Simeon Sumain New York City silversmith mm -hmm. it's always praised for its beautiful sort of Queen Anne um, kind of thing it's based on a um, Chinese porcelain rice bowl with a cover mm -hmm. um, and what you don't realize is in fact as you point out that the silver is probably coming from Bolivia mined in the Potosi the um, by basically indigenous slave labor um, that is there to support sugar, which is being uh, harvested by slaves on the Caribbean islands. It's owned by a New Yorker who's involved in the sugar and slave trade. So this thing just, you know, behind its beauty has this incredible story of exploitation um, involved in it that <coughs> speaks to the entire Atlantic world. So this is the power, this is the story that needs to be told that these objects, we can appreciate them, but we can also be uncomfortable with them. That's interesting, and, and, and sometimes even the curators don't see it. And not and again. I, I just a quick anecdote. I went to a, a museum where I should be named nameless. I had a, a, a silver sugar, silver not sugar, silver slave candlestick, and they have chains on them. It's the, there's a slave collar and an actual chain that chains the collar to the base of it. And I'm talk, asking the, the curator, "Can I see it? Can I see the chain?" I said, "There's no slave. There's no chain here." He had never even looked at it. So, see it maybe he didn't want to see it but um it's it's uh there are subtleties and then there are the very articulate things like those that uh it's something um that that is astonishing sometimes
Fred Wilson to bring you out. Right? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Great. Um, so I'm Anita Wiggers. And I like this. This is a nice segue thinking about seeing and looking at objects and also thinking about who is seen and what stories are seen in the histories and theories that we construct. And that's really the work that I wanted to know who would beautifully uh, discuss. That's really the work that I've, I've been focusing on in terms of craft. Um, I am somebody who considers my, I consider myself a platform builder and I like to create spaces for many different kinds of voices to come to the table. I'm not interested in being a sole authority on anything. I'm interested in hearing multiple perspectives and that's partly why I'm so excited about everything that's been said and what's going to happen over the next few days. Um, I thought that I'd start by just um, telling you what the title of my proposed dissertation was going to be. And I say it going to be because it was approved, but then I left graduate school. And I'll talk about that a little bit more on Saturday. But my proposed dissertation was Producing a Place Like Home, Diasporic Domesticity in Chicago's South Asian Suburban Community. And as you can imagine, in 1995 uh, at the University of Chicago, that was not looked upon very kindly by the art history department. Um, I was working a lot with Arjuna Potterai and Carol Breckenridge in anthropology, um, Homi Baba, who got me thinking in incredible ways, but kind of ruined my writing for a little while. <laughs> 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 well, it ruined because you talk forever. Exactly, <laughs> yes, yes. And I can actually be quoted, which you can't do with his writing. Right? Um, so, so, this all came out of a course that was being offered called The American Family Home, which uh, prompted me to really try to understand this very particular Anglo-Saxon, Christian-based, heteronormative framework. Um, now, we were not talking about things in those ways in 1995. <laughs> that is 2018 ways of describing it. Um, I had a lot of fighting to do to, uh, to even get to, um, to address this question about everyday life uh, in, from the immigrant perspective, and that really was what introduced me to craft. Uh, when you walk into people's homes and they are coming from another place, there is a craft object that they bring with them. A table, a chair, if they're wealthy, most times it's a textile or um, a piece of leather, or in the case of Indian families, it might be a little, little silver murti that they bring for their home altar, right? Um, something made by somebody's hands is coming with them and stands in for a whole body of, of work and a whole culture that is not an other. It is a culture that exists in someplace else. And that is really what I'm trying to do with craft is to get us away from talking about things as other and center, um, to push back on, on this idea of what is the margin and what is the center in many, many ways. Um, you know, with this, um, you know, this is the kind of work that, that I did a lot with my exhibitions um, for, I would say the bulk of the work that I've done in the craft field in the last 15, 20 years has been um, exhibition work. And it's about using the exhibition as a platform for this kind of inquiry and opening it up for other people to experiment. Um, Shannon created with Judith Lehman the exhibition Gestures of Resistance, for example. So it was a way to test out what was happening in different parts of truly the art field. Um, and I will admit it that I'm trained as an art historian. I like to say I'm a really bad art historian or a naughty art historian because I don't <laughs> do proper art history. Irreverent one. That's okay. Irreverent. Ooh, I like that better. A irreverent art historian. Um, but that is my training. That is where my questions come from. That is where. Um, my, the, the largest amount of my knowledge is based, and um, I recognize that as a disciplinary boundary. However, I'm ornery, and if you tell me what a disciplinary boundary is, I'm gonna push on that edge as hard as I can and figure out where it can be stretched um, to, to a breaking point where it does or does not work. But, um, so that's kind of what I'm trying to do with craft. And now that I, I find myself in a very different position with developing this brand new master's program, um, and uh, I'm switching from this, this exhibition sort of model of creating things that are addressing the general public to now a very focused thing of training students 
to go out and um, understand how they play a role in creating craft history and theory um, for themselves. And I'm using a lot of that anthropology training and um, a lot of work that I did as a metalsmith. Um, some of you may know that I worked as a jeweler. I wasn't very good at that, so I don't do it anymore. Um, <laughs> but I made jewelry and I sold on Artful Home and you know had a successful business for a number of years. Um, and uh, so I'm bringing a lot of experiences to this that I think are a little bit of an unusual sort of array of um, understanding of the craft field and what happens out there um, in different ways. Um, I would also I would also say that one of the things that I'm interested in and I'd love to hear more about as the next few days go forward, um, Tara Lee Tappert very generously donated uh, some of her research archives to Warren Wilson College. And these are materials that were used to prepare a series of four volumes um, that were produced for the Museum of Art and Design with the idea of being these four volumes serving as a history of 20th century uh, craft. Now with that, she also gave me all of her files from 2002 when she was teaching uh, the history of craft at George Washington University. Now, over and over, you will hear people say, craft is not intersectional, craft is not diverse. There is no history about African-American makers. There is no history about this and that and the other. Looking at the syllabus, I'm embarrassed that I didn't know what she was teaching at the time because it's there. So what has happened between 2002 and now in the way we teach the history of craft in art programs has deleted a lot of this kind of material culture work that is out there and it's, it's lost and I think we need to bring it back. And I wanna understand from you all who work through material culture, I need to understand what happened and how we can fix that because y'all are doing this and it's, it's not part of the artification of craft and craft history, and I think we need to go back to that a little bit. Um, for me, I, I sort of see this field the way, you know, that, that elephant story where the blind men are touching the elephant and one person touches the, the tail and thinks it's the elephant is a rope and, and another blind man touches the trunk uh, and thinks that, you know, it's a hose and another one touches the, the legs and thinks that an elephant looks like a tree. Um, and for me, uh, creating this program is really about trying to um, think about the way all of these different disciplinary approaches to craft can be put together to create this kind of an elephant and teach through that sort of um, way of piecing all of these different perspectives together. That's great. And so what you really remind us is the difference behind, between sort of um, working on an exhibition as a means of critique. Um, where you can sort of work along one vein uh, productively versus the idea of constructing a curriculum, um, which is stagnant because you can't just assume you're gonna be critiquing one thing, but you're actually trying to get students to be open-minded and walk around an issue uh, as much as you can. So you've gotta be able to <coughs> jump up and down different platforms as you move around the field uh, or fields up um, and try to figure out what you're going to expose the students to. Totally, totally. And this is being taught through art, through the art department, but this is an opportunity to um, to maybe construct it differently and shake things up a little bit. And that's what I'm, I'm hoping to hear some ideas from everybody here that we can use and, and engage in trying to do that. And I don't think you need to be apologetic about be having tried your hand, I mean, I've tried my hand at different things and I know I'm not gonna quit my day job to, uh, <laughs> to become you know, a maker or something, but you know, so like it, it informs the way you think about these things just as much as reading anthropology or actually I would suggest you're even a product of the sociology, the old school sociology department at Chicago um, is very much within your DNA um, and the way you're approaching the uh, Chicago South Asian community. Um, that's very much uh, a part of this that you're doing. So, you know, you pick up all these different perspectives as you go through and how <coughs> rich it is um, that you can sort of drink from all these different wells to then produce something which is complex, which is, after all, a humanistic activity. And you know, we do need to remind ourselves that ultimately we're in a humanities um, kind of domain, um, not just for using, I mean, even sort of Steve talking at uh, SPS, 
I mean, it's still very much of a humanities age way of, of thinking about this. So that's where you're going beyond the simple, um, is it Coke Zero or Diet Coke? Which one are they on? <laughs> <laughs> I guess this is our plug, right, for <laughs> Coke promotion. But you know, so that's the way in which people sort of separate out um, art, science, humanities, and technology. Um, and in some respects, what we're talking about in terms of this, uh, this idea of craft studies is starting to try to bring these things back into conversation. I'm Alicia Dina Cola, um, and my discipline is anthropology. Craft studies and anthropology is quite small, and I am so thrilled to be here where I can actually <laughs> talk about this and all of the different ways that, um, that everybody is talking about it. It seems like I'm doing something new when I'm doing it in the midst of anthropology, and then I get here and I realize it's, it's speaking all sorts of things that other people are doing as well, and it's really exciting. Um, two main things. Um, and asked us to talk a little bit about ourselves and what brought us here, and so I took him literally. Um, I <laughs> I grew up I grew up in the home of carpenters. I literally grew up in a cabinet shop, um, and uh, but it's a bit like growing up in a Catholic home, which I also did at some point in time. It sort of enters into you and and does what it does to you, whether or not you actually go to church every Sunday or not. It just is there. Um, and so I study ideas of craft and authenticity largely through language. Um, and that, and, and I, I want to make clear that it's really connected for me as an anthropologist to practice, right? So when I talk to people about craft, I'm sitting there at their pounding blocks onto textiles, right? And when I talk to people about craft, I'm watching them make jewelry, um, watching them do the things that they're doing. But, um, but words are kind of the way that, that the pillars of the structures that we create, right, they uphold some of the structures that we create. And so they become really, really important and critical to me. When we say craft, how are we marshalling it? And who's get, getting to marshal it? Who's getting to marshal and say what is a craft and what isn't? What bodies are craft bodies and what bodies are design bodies, right? Um, and I started working recently in Costa Rica. Um, so I'm, I'm looking at the different ways that people define authenticity in art and craft and how they define craft itself in these different kinds of um, nationalistic uh, moments for each, for each place and who it is that gets, gets to define it, how they're defining it, how different that is in very different contexts. Um, and so I'm really enjoying being able to see um, the, the kind of, you know, I've talked about this in India, but being able to sort of look at, at Costa Rica where craft is really sort of um, grounded in the idea of tourism. And India has in some ways been able to extract itself from that, even though all of the craft artisans that I've ever talked to really need those tourists to buy their stuff. The heritage and the, and the depth and the length of time that they've been doing it has allowed them to sort of back off and kind of claim an authenticity that doesn't have much to do with tourism. Whereas in Costa Rica, that's a very different story and it's sort of um, grounded in this idea of place and newness as opposed to um, heritage work, although there's, there's some overlap there as well. Um, but for me, the idea part is really critical and really important, ideas of craft, right? Not just the craft, but, um, but how people use what they do and how they feel what they do and understand what they do and how important that is for other people to understand in the same way that people understand those things about themselves. Um, and how those kinds of things can, um, like I said before, sort of create those structures um, on which we build, we build um, ideas of power and um, context and distinction, right? Ideas of, of uh, when, when we define things, we are in fact distinguishing them from other things. We're not just saying what they are, we're saying what they're not allowed to be as well. And those happen very differently in different places. It's not just you know, a single thing. And yet, when I talk about authenticity to people, everybody shakes their head. Of course, I know what you're talking about. When I say craft, people shake their head. Yes, of course, you know what craft is. But when you start asking people, what is it? And when you start comparing different definitions amongst people, mm -hmm. it gets really complex. Um, and so that's really sort of where my work um, 
where my work has, has focused over the past decade or so. That's great. You, you know, there are a couple things that I think are critical to keep in mind in terms of the way in which you undertake field work. One was talking about language. Um, and I would say it's both spoken and written. Um, for instance, as somebody who, when I was trying to understand things in the 1950s, obviously I couldn't interview anybody, but starting to read everything I could and then starting to pick up certain buzzwords um, that came up. And they start to become signifiers about these value systems um, and trying to be aware of who's dictating them. You know, not wasn't just Rose Lipka and that's it alone, but you know, ways in which how people were talking about work, about techniques, about styles, about anything um, became, you know, you could start to map these different words that were truly um, sort of universal words over different periods of time and trying to understand the, the mindset um, of that time using that kind of record. But I've also been really struck um, when you're talking about interviewing people while, you know, they're pressing their box <laughs> on the cotton. Um, the time I've spent in different shops, I mean, I always feel like that's such an important part of my research is to get into somebody's shop and talk to them there and actually have them walk me through something and have them use their hands with me to show something um, has been so instructive because it's a way in which it is less framed um, than if someone even comes in and takes an environmental portrait or, you know, and I was really reminded of that of going through you know, reading a lot of literature, say, of Sam Maloof and the way in which he talked about um, his work and, you know, his hand is involved in everything. First thing I walked into a shop, there's a time clock and punch cards on the wall. <laughs> and the guys who've worked for him for, you know, 10, 20 years are punching in and out. And, you know, so that's something that is never talked about. Um, it's never part of that portrait that is portrayed, um, that is promoted but it's right there. And, you know, that's where I always feel like going and visiting somebody on site um, can't hide much um, if it's in in the middle of, uh, of things being made. Mm -hmm. yeah, I talk a little bit in um, the upcoming paper that I'm doing this weekend. Um, I can't remember if it's Friday or Saturday. Um, <laughs> it's, it's tomorrow. It's tomorrow. <laughs> I'm ready, really. Um, but um, I talk a little bit about a uh, designer from Jaipur taking her students out to the room to see the, you know, to see the actual craft being done in a shop. And then that there's a real tension there, right? And this idea that these middle class, um, very educated students who want to be designers are going out into the, um, the villages, some of whom may never have been to a small village even 40 kilometers away to see the real craft being done. Um, and so there's really a tension there between that, how important that is, and how that's also structured and, um, and creates uh, distinction as well. And it's a really fascinating, really fascinating to study. Actually, there's even the control. I'm, I'm, excuse me for a quick Jaipur uh, rant here. But blue pottery in Jaipur. Um, I was really interested in seeing it be being made because it's a it's a footwear based uh, ceramic. You don't see that being made um, in the states. And there's a uh, firm there, Mirja, that is sort of the equivalent of a Noki in uh, textiles, who sort of control the blue pottery mythologies, if you will, um, that they sort of revived it uh, in the late 1960s. And they kept saying, "Where's it made?" And they're sort of like, "No, you know." Yeah, but I tell you, finally, I was able to locate um, somebody who said, oh, I know, it's a village, you know, it's, a, it's far beyond Bagbury. And so I'm driving out in the countryside, stopping every five miles, asking where this place is. I pull into this town, I can't see anything. Um, and keep asking people, and then finally said, oh, follow me, and sort of go down this alley. And then on this back, um, up on the second floor, is this complete pile of, um, of crickware um, in various stages of production that they were doing work for Mirja and also for themselves. Um, and they were selling through the internet. And so they had no problem in terms of thinking about authorship uh, of what was theirs, what was Mirja's. It just got stamped differently. Um, but the idea was, and they didn't even describe themselves as potters, they were farmers. Just 
Um, and so, I'm going to stop. So <laughs> this, this, is, this is for another conversation. But it's, you know, it, it prompted me in terms of all of who's controlling what narrative um, and authentic versus control, and yeah. et cetera. Absolutely. Thanks for indulging me. I move. Uh, yeah, like other speakers, I'm also happy to be here. Um, so my background is design trained as an industrial designer. So but also did all my background in interaction design. Uh, but much of the work I've been doing is what we call often design and studies. Um, and, and a convention of design and studies is often focused on, on, on the product, right? As I relate the pain, what kind of meaning this product has, what kind of meaning we ascribe to it. But also often, we, Design studies, the combination of conventional sense focus on the designer, right? This figure of designer, who was he, who was she, and 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 kind of render this figure as the main maker. Often this person, as in, you know, we don't know them actually that well. Often the maker is someone, someone else in, in 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 outside of Western world and doing doing the work on their exploited uh, exploited condition of labor. Um, but this one traces actually. The object, huh? and not as isolated, but as something that's situated in the network of relations, different forms of relation, political, economic, social, and environmental. Uh, then basically, one, we can see different acts of making in different contexts and different moments that shape this, this object. Uh, and this would allow us to, to depart from this hegemonic figure of designer. Uh, that often is communicated to us as this, you know, genius person, and this communication often happens by institution, right? Museum, galleries, and you know, even research and academia that's behind this. But there are lots of acts of making uh, that at work here, and that's where we can kind of find and trace these <coughs> these careful practices of making, and that are authentic, to, authentic to this to the materiality, to the capacities of material. Uh, and, and, and this is the case for both the seemingly highly designed objects and those seemingly a designed objects, such as passports. Right? We don't often think of passport as something being designed, it's just there, right? While, I don't know, a famous chair by a designer is very much a design thing. So my work's often be on the maker, the case of objects that are mundane, that are not seen as designed, and we are not able to identify an individual designer uh, and when you look at this kind of mundane objects that are a design, then the point or the way I've been working with this type of object, including passport, is to not, you know, take their design for granted or look at, you know, what's their graphic reality, what kind of nationalistic representation, for example, exists in passport, <coughs> what passport designs, right? What passport? What kind of conditions of being and moving and, 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 and residing in the world that this object design? And that's Uh, so my research in the six, seven years, and that's what was my one of my dissertation uh, in design, was how the right to freedom of movement has historically been commodified to these objects, right? And, and, and this came up through lots of interviews I did with undocumented migrants in Europe, including Sweden, and border transgressors, and, and those who, who try to cross the border, seek asylum, and seek refuge, but the problem is that they don't have a passport, or they don't have a good passport, as many of them would be, right? The passports, you know, if you are from Afghanistan, you, know, you can only travel to four or five countries without visa. Or if you're from Syria or Iraq. So what do you do then? You have to find a passport that you know, grants you the ability uh, to, to move or grant you this freedom of movement that much of the Western citizens enjoy and take for granted. Uh, the point is that the modern passport, as we know it, uh, might not have, basically, may not have anything or any relation to the idea of craft, right? Because the modern passport is not the old passport that would get its authenticity from, let's say, the hand of the queen or the king. The modern passport is authentic because it's reproducible, right? The passports would be seen authentic because they all look like a king, 
if you would have a password assigned by your president, that's legally that invalid. So you cannot use that. Passports are valid as long as they all look like the same. And that makes them make you be authentic. And this is the whole idea, right? The modern idea of production. And that's the whole thing at the heart of the modern production of media. For any system to generate meaning, it needs to be reproducible, right? Recognizable. Yeah. Yep. Repeat itself. Yep. But exactly it's this repetition that makes it also vulnerable. Right, to intervention. It's the repetition that makes it vulnerable, right? We talk about performative aspects of reproduction and repetition. And performance performance is never produce the same result. Okay? And that's where the intervention is possible. In case of passport, that's what makes forgery possible. So during my research, I, I interviewed lots of people who use for passport, and I ended up finding passport forgers and smugglers who, who, who use in this. And you put this next to this narrative of the state about the most secure counterfeit passport. And then you see this forger that do such a wonderful crap <laughs> intervention, right? Highly secure, digitalized passport. I could not show an image, but two years ago, a very wanted forger in, in Thailand was arrested after eight years policeman trying to find this guy. His name is Doc, Pas Doctor of Passport. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, I mean, we might laugh, but the idea was that this guy was a refugee. He was trying to get into Australia. He couldn't. He was a nurse in his own country. He wanted to go to Australia to be a physician, but he couldn't. So he ended up being a middleman to secure like, um, money for, for his travel. He didn't manage. So he continued there, and he became a forger in, in, in Thailand. So when the image came out of the, 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 the press conference, you see all these materials that he used that you can find in any workshop of a craft person. The type of machine he used, the type of stamp, the type of material he used, it, it identi it's identical, he's a craft person. Uh, so basically, my point is that the work that forgers do, or passport forgers do, teach us very well the materiality of meta concepts of a citizenship, right? Or borders, or sovereignty. sovereignty. Uh, and, 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 and kind of they, 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 they answer to this discursive level of these concepts, right? We tend to think of cut citizenship or borders as only discursive level, but forgers remind us very much that these are, we can only operate and, and perform these concepts as long as they are materialized. But the moment you materialize them, the moment you materialize border, you materialize citizenship, you know, through taxes, the moment you materialize identity in terms of passport, you make it also vulnerable. There is a tension here. And the question is not to solve this tension. The question is who has the authority or agency to negotiate this tension. So this is where I've been kind of looking and it's kind of interesting in, in terms of in terms of how we can think of crap as a way to counter this current narratives of you know technological reproduction. Uh, yeah. That's fabulous. Um, I mean to me what I'm really reminded of we're we're in a period of post-designer design studies uh, in some respects, um, you know, sort of getting away from the uh, the way in which the elevation from, which really focused on sort of research and development, the idea that the designer was able to s do all these time motion studies and, and sort of know the right materials and, you know, voila. Um, and what you're dealing with is uh, a, almost a post-professional um, kind of design studies that is really not, focused on that so much as what's happening in the creative process. But to me, the other thing that's really interesting is thinking about is it an inherent part of craft that is vulnerable, the idea of vulnerability, uh, because of skill and the way in which skill is so um, moving in so many different directions um, that it's used to counter something else, that it can be exploited um, in different ways, or perhaps reworded, repackaged uh, in some ways, um, that this idea of vulnerability um, becomes a really interesting concept for thinking about what's uniting a lot of what we're talking about. So I thought um, there are a couple things that when I was reading through different works that you all had, um, had done that Catherine had provided me with, there were a couple things that I was with, and I thought that there might be some pairings that might be uh, might be interesting to talk to. So this would be for Steve and Alicia. Um, 
the notion about collaboration and hierarchy. Um, so Steve talked about the collaborative act in terms of um, the CNC machine in Wendell Castle shop, um, in terms of what it's done to remove drudgery and how it sort of creates this collaborative work environment that some of these um, actually re-engineered uh, a postal sorter uh, to be able to use as a what six axis carving machine and various other things. Um, Alicia talked about sort of a hierarchies of collaboration uh, between um, the, the person actually doing the printing um, who's got command of all the natural dies and the 32 steps that you're going through in terms of uh, stamping, bathing, cleaning, um, setting, more than you name it, um, you know, sort of the complexities of that, but yet it ends up being hierarchical in terms of who ultimately is known um, or what mythology about um, the royal court or other people sort of buying these things. So I'd, I'd like to hear the two of you talk about this idea of collaboration and hierarchy or recognition maybe uh, within it. For instance, with Wendell's uh, sack laminated stuff, who gets credit? Who who knows who did what on um, those pieces? Because it's signed WC and the date on the bottom. Well, um, I mean, I think there's the, the question of collaboration and hierarchy in the practice, and then there's a related but separate question around the stories we tell about those. Yeah. So I think that, um, and this actually connects with some of the points that were coming up around authenticity, I think, as well. Um, it strikes me that many craft practices, at least of, of the ones that I know of and that I've encountered in my work, uh, can be remarkably supple, integrative, open to new things, um, can be splendors for, I mean, in the same way you described some of the work coming out of the 19th century and the people who were doing that work. Mm -hmm. um, some of the problems I think come in when we, when we step back and stories are told about those practices, powerful stories become told about those practices and then the uh, collaboration starts to look a little bit more like what collaboration meant right after World War II in France, right? Collaboration was a, no longer like this shiny thing that we all love, but actually it was suspect, it was suspicious, it was a problem. So I think that relationship between practice and stories actually comes up uh, quite powerfully across the set. In, in terms of collaboration and hierarchy, I think that, um, I mean, to me that they, they both speak to uh, sort of dimensions or maybe axes along which the fundamental collective nature of craft practices is organized. So I've never met perfectly flat collaboration. I've never met one that didn't have some kind of asymmetry, multiple asymmetries involved, sometimes running in different directions between different actors. Um, I don't know, short of very stark and brutalistic situations, I don't know that I've met that many pure hierarchies that didn't involve some degree or element of give and take, right? Some sort of, you know, in a very stark way you could speak to a form of collaboration. So I think that putting those things, putting those things together is really important. Um, and and I, I don't regard them as, as opposites. I regard them as tensions maybe or, or poles, at least in the sense I've thought about. Yeah, I mean, I was, I was just raising it because it, it is one of these things within your article about thinking that Marv, the guy who engineers all this stuff, is brilliant in terms of adaptability and, and sorting it out, and yet, does he get any kind of recognition within promotional materials or, you know, sort of, who are the unsung heroes in Wendell Castle Studio? And, and I'm sort of reminded, Charles Eliot Norton uh, in the late 19th century in Boston, sort of very much important in the uh, Society of Arts and Crafts in Boston, um, had this phrase that he talked about mutually helpful relations um, that was between the usually university trained or upper class uh, white male um, who knew something about styles and had gone to Europe or you know, sort of knew something about taste and style and then there was the immigrant craftsman who was skilled, who could make anything, but didn't have any original, had no sense of what to do. So this is a mutually helpful relation that a designer of an upper class designer, um, and sometimes architect, sometimes not, um, and then the immigrant craftsman were basically human machines um, who were collaborating and producing these new 
product um, as a uh, critique, uh, as an alternative to industrial production. <coughs> so you're just shifting it a little bit in terms of thinking about mechanization um, and perspective and another form of mutually helpful relations. Yeah. There's a, a distinction that comes from Hollywood films um, that has to do with the way royalties are allocated between above the line and below the line work. And I often think that a lot of our collaborative practices have that nature. So in, in the academia, above the line and below the line might be about who counted in office, right? We think about right. papers we write, there's one or two or three, a small number of authors that, that are recognized as authors. There's many more people involved in the work where we do ethnographic work, artistic and things are involved in the work, not usually that's true of lots of different things, right? So it's true of Hollywood films, it's true of, of uh, papers we write, um, it's true of the achieved products of craft practices as well, right? Yeah. So I mean, a crucial tension. Um, the, it's an interesting, it's interesting uh, it, that you that you brought out in, in some of the work that I do, the collaboration between designers and um, printers, specifically because that is a really critical collaboration, right? It is hierarchical. And so it's often easy to suggest that it's unfair. And, and in fact, um, there, there are things that are, um, that are problematic about it, of course, but um, most of the printers that I work with have previous to the designer coming in, worked with local farmers. They sold to local farmers. So the people they sold to and the people they designed for were right there in their backyard. They talked to them all the time. Um, once uh, Chinese products started coming into India and um, people started buying um, saris that were made out of um, synthetics and um, much more uh, cheap and uh, well-wearing um, textiles, um, the, the jobs that printers were, the jobs that printers had were disappearing really, really quickly. Um, and so the, the designer coming in and, and connecting the printer to other audiences, right, to other places, was a critical move for printers and allowed them to keep doing what they're doing. And the, the problem, of course, is that it's very, very difficult for a printer to move into that designer space. Um, that's a thing that's very hard. Um, designers come from middle class, educated, English speaking, traveling, um, you know, communities in India, and printers almost always come from small villages, um, also educated, but not English educated, and educated in a very different way, and um, and so that that collaboration is really is really key. It's interesting also though to think about how those meanings can get changed, often by very well-meaning things. So for instance, um, geographical indications is a kind of copyright that um, uh, is, is given to groups as opposed to individuals by copyright. And uh, just recently, and, and it, it's, it's spreading all over, um, all over the world, it's very much like um, terroir with wine, so connected to the, to the soil, connected to the, the local area, and given to groups of people in a, in a sort of traditional sort of way. Um, Bagru just got its geographical indication status in 2011, and um, I, looking at that, I thought to myself, what is this gonna do to the collaboration between designers and printers? Because it indexes creativity specifically with the printer. And right now, what the designers are getting out of this, or previous to 2011, what the designers were getting out of this was a kind of claim to creativity and newness. That was their claim. It wasn't that they could travel all over the world, right? It was that they owned in some ways taking tradition, keeping it, changing it, making it new and innovative, and being able to, and being able to sell it. And so once geographical indications came along, it was specifically giving that sort of ownership of design back to the printers. And um, I'm not sure, it's been eight years and printers are still sending stuff out and, and still successfully printing, um, but I'm not sure, I haven't been back to, to ask that specific question of how has it, how has it really affected um, that, that, uh, that collaboration. Uh, but printers also kind of have an ace in the hole there, which is that 
Um, they also work with designers from outside of India who will come in and just buy what they have and take it away. And so that's a collaboration that allows printers to, um, to not have to deal as closely with the state. So if they're dealing with Indian printers, there's all sorts of state um, rules and laws and things that the state wants to impose upon printers. And if they can sell it to people taking it out directly, um, they don't have to deal with those. So there's so those, those, those collaborations are very important, often very hierarchical, but critical. Yeah, I'm also thinking about they have different um, national craft awards too. So there are a couple of five group printers that that also gave them certain identities you know, as part of the uh, handicraft uh, arm of independence. Uh, Absolutely, which is another fairly significant hierarchy, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and, and local one, yeah. Great. Um, so then I was also thinking about um, how Adrian and Mahmoud sort of connected with each other. And I started thinking about the black and more figure. Mm -hmm. um, and could one actually think about black and mooring um, in the same way you have past organ? Um, and what that, what is that doing? <laughs> what is that doing to sort of push back in terms of thinking about some of the identities, some of the um, the ways in which bodies are trying to be controlled? I mean, it, you know, it, it's not. I, I was thinking about other ways of taking object and gerund um, mm -hmm. together, mm -hmm. linking them together. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think it's a fascinating question. I'm just trying to sort it out. Black and more, like, for instance. Uh, well, just trying to imagine um, how these objects, I mean, you are halfway there in terms of suggesting how they characterize different um, hierarchies, different statuses, sure. um, yeah. you know, much as um, there was an exhibition at the Yale Center for British Art that dealt with a black figure in the long 18th century. That you know, it was a sculpture of um, in black basalt um, versus white marble. Um, but there were also paintings that um, had the black servant um, exotic next to a mahogany table, along with exotic objects, um, including you know, objects from India. Um, you name it, and the the it was just simply one other imported object. So ways in which um, you are thinking about these figures occupying space um, in these rooms, and what are they calling to uh, in terms of those clients? How are they articulating people coming in? To, is, is it another form of this objectification of having a console table in your William Kent um, hallway that's got an ebonized uh, figure in it. Mm -hmm. What about the dining table where you have servants bringing stuff to and from, but then the table pick itself mm -hmm. um, also is reminding you of place and who's in service to whom. So you're talking about the kind of dynamism of this notion of that Blackamore is a, is a, a static figure, but it's this whole notion of having to kind of embody servitude or the, the, uh, all of that uh, is, is, is not just static. It is something that is part of the way people interact with the objects, like with your paintings, sculptures. There's, there's a whole dynamic environment that um, that the objects uh, fit in, and then the objects also um, kind of engender um, kind of that, that kind of energy. Mm -hmm. um, and so maybe that is. But I'm, I'm just I guess thinking of them as such um, um, uh, sort of having no agency. You know, see what I'm saying? I, I mean, maybe I shouldn't be looking at them as having no agency of their own. Um, uh, because I was interested in what you were saying about the passport as having a kind of an agency that it's not just a piece of paper that gets activated when someone else interacts with it. But it, it, so, so uh, and, and when you think about the um, objects that represent servants, you want to think of them as not having their own um, power. Uh, but I think I need to re really rethink that and see what, what are they doing. I, I don't know that they are speaking back necessarily, um, but there are ways uh, in which we can look at them as more active participants and also kind of representing something that they're, they're, they're there to represent the um, other the, uh, the new world or the old world or, or other, they're, they're rep there to represent faraway places. Um, and they're there to um, make the owner look like they are international 
be sophisticated and worldly, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But they also speak that. They also represent what they are as servants. And, and they kind of implicate. There's a kind of implication. They implicate the, the environment in ways that we can see it now. And maybe they weren't, and the owners didn't see it at, that way then. So there's, there's lots of ways of kind of turning that around. I don't know if that was your question, but I like what I'm talking about. <laughs> South Carolina, where you'll have um, slave artisans who are among the most valued um, bits of property in Charleston, yeah. who are working in the silversmith shops of Daniel Gow, um, who are working in um, the cabinet making shops of Thomas L. Um, but can we find anything, trace elements of them? You know, people try to look, is there a bit of African American um, telltale sign? Mm -hmm. They're totally blended in. So is that a form of um, invisibility that's power um, mm -hmm. at that point. See, it's, it's a way in which you can start to thinking about the agency of not the product so much as the invisibility of the maker, mm -hmm. able to slide in there and make something of the highest quality mm -hmm. for an Anglo audience who doesn't know that they, perhaps that they made it. Yeah, yeah. And there are a few um, craftsmen there that are known, just uh, in, uh, African American craftsmen around the country, but not very many. And so yeah, that, 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 is, that is a very powerful kind of question. Um, yeah, uh, going back to the question, it's a bit hard to, to maybe apply this to everything. I mean, it's quite explicitly about passport. I'm not sure if you can, but I mean, one thing is. Through that line of thinking. Is yeah, that line of, th yeah, of course. Um, and I mean, kind of connecting back to this notion of collaboration, we often tend to think about collaboration of different natures beyond the objects, but we forget that the objects also participate, right, in moving things. I mean, they're not only, they, they don't only represent the world, they, they participate, they enact the world, right? right? So that's the point with passport. We often think passport represent different migration policies, different nationalistic politics in different times. Um, you know, in US, you know, Cold War, if people associate with communism, you can deprive them from their passport, vis-a-vis their right to move and deprive. Uh, but in practice, when, when you trace such a moving object, you think how much it actually shapes back the migration policy. So rather than, or if you trace the colonial history of the passport, specifically in the case of India, how, for example, Indian migrants, even though India was part of the British Empire, and supposedly Indian migrants could just go to Canada, right? But no, they could not, you know? So they, they had to, 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 to put a specific money, you know, apply it kind of a form of old form of visa, and so on and so forth. So you see, for example, that these objects are not just product of a state. They are actually defining the state. They are defining the empire state. And very much like, you know, the refugee right? Uh, when you think about how basically, what in 1920s, we had also been, back, back then we had the notion of Russian refugee crisis, right? Now we're talking about European refugee crisis, but in 1921, we had this problem of called Russian refugee crisis. People were deprived of their nationality after the revolution. And then, and then, and then you know, a group of diplomats started thinking about how we can solve this issue. So in the start thinking how nation state building is the practice that produced refugees, they came with this idea of what if we design a new passport for these people? So they shift the question from the actual, you know, the actual question was that it's the nation state that produced refugees, right? Those who lose the right to be united in national country to become refugees. So they came with the idea of designing the refugee tax, right? Because today it's dominant. And you see how much refugee law was shaped by this idea of designing a tax force. So again, my point is that objects don't simply represent, or they are not only instruments of certain policies or ideology, they very much are trying to shape back, they participate in, in, in the production. things that, that allow us to think in certain ways and cut off 
other way of being able to think. And so, and so in that, in that kind of speaking, in that kind of semiotic, the language of a past core, right? Um, you're, you're creating the pillars of the structure that we live underneath, and both allowing and disallowing ways of thinking about things. So maybe we should. We got about twenty minutes left before we head to the seventh floor or wherever. Um, but if people <laughs> had questions, um, I'm happy to entertain them. That you know, Lisa's got microphones to wander through the audience here. If people, we just yeah. need you to talk into the microphone because for the live streaming. Questions? Hi, uh, this is not necessarily a question, but an observation about what uh, Adrian was talking about, which I was very fascinated about. The whole thing about the black and white, you know, they're not just really objects, but they also can be seen as figures of aspiration. If you think of Monica Miller's discussion about the role of clothing, the transfer of nakedness or some makeshift clothing into a kind of formal uniform that maybe the black and white always took. It was also seen as a kind of social transition so that the, the representation in whether it's in glass or you know, um, porcelain, it's, it's also about a certain kind of fluidity in terms of status because that person is no longer purely kind of primitive African, it has become a primitive African who's become westernized with the possibility of moving into another period. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah and there's a, that is a very interesting aspect of it. A lot of these are based on court, court hat, right, that dress, that the, because they were, dre were dressed in, in finery, et cetera, they were looked upon as, as uh, having a higher status, et cetera, but then they become kind of objectified in these in these things, and the, the people that, and that, yeah, this is another problem with understanding about makers. I mean, you don't know who made them, it's, it's certainly. And I, I would say, I say there are workshops in, in Italy, in the Netherlands, and in, in you know, England, France, that are looking at them as, as kind of representations, rather than in giving them any kind of, um, I don't know, I, I have to think about uh, about that, about intention, because we don't know about intention. And so what, what happens is you, when you look at a lot of them together and where they end up and how they're seen, then that's how I start interpreting them. But they uh, some of them are naked and have chains and, and are looking like savages, and that's another type. So uh, I think that the whole issue of sartorial, sartorial issues are very important. And Monica Miller was talking about dandyism. when you were talking about the, the process and um, the, the idea of the, the production happening and, and people who are um, making in these different factories or the immigrant worker, as you described it, who is fulfilling a, a particular task, right? And thinking about this in terms of production, which you were talking about it as well. And it, it's just made me think, I mean, my first thought was, um, what were those? What were the folks who were working in those places making on their own? What were they making when no one was looking? Mm -hmm. And um, we obviously don't have traces of all of that, but there have to have been things that were being made somewhere um, that we just don't know about. And how do you recapture that? How do you go back and figure out what that is? Mm -hmm. I can only think anecdotally. Um, yeah. It became one of the key things when I was looking at the furniture designed by the Green Brothers in Pasadena um, and made by the Hall Brothers shop that I was able to talk to descendants of the different people I was able to locate who worked in that shop. And each of those families had things that um, were made by those individuals. Um, and it, one of them became key that very obscure. There was only one set of furniture um, produced by Green and Green that had, dove, had dovetail. Um, 
and it was the Thorson House up in Berkeley. It wasn't around Pasadena at all. Um, and it was shot by Carl Lappel's family that had a dovetail box that he had made. It's the only thing that I'd seen, and that became a key part that I was able to sort of figure out that he was the one on site up at Thorson House, away from the shop doing all the table saw work uh, down in Pasadena. He made all the stuff there under sort of the aegis of the green design with the Hall Brothers mentality, but using his techniques. So it's a weird way to think about it, but it's actually finding these things that people made on their own, um, just on their own time, which they didn't always have a lot of. So there are, there are these trace elements um, that one can use productively um, to try to sort out sort of what so much of shop production, if you are working beyond just one person, is you're doing what a customer wants according to the rubric of the shop um, with some of your own techniques. And to try to sort some of that stuff out is very complex and it requires a large body of probably in his spare time as a, as a way to launch his own career, which we don't think happens because we don't know more about him, but there must just be more examples of, of this. So kind of, I'm kind of guilty. It actually, it's a field that's not represented here, and that would be psychology, um, because William James, as one of the founding fathers of the discipline of psychology, has uh, this whole uh, notion about the division between the brain and the body, um, and sort of talks about the, you know, it's basically that designer craftsman uh, kind of uh, division uh, of thinking about there's certain people who are well suited to creativity um, in the life of the mind, and there's some people who are brute force. Um, and there, there are strange ways that that then gets inflected into other things in terms of nationality, race. Okay. I was also thinking what, what Ned was saying about going into people's workshops, but also going into people's homes. And when I was doing some oral history around, I guess that this second generation, um, even third generation Jewish immigrants in the East End of London, and what was always still the slop end of the trade, but was enormous craft skills. When I was in their houses, and this would be even in the early 70s, the two of us was looking at that. The object that we kept seeing in everyone's house was a cocktail cabinet. And that was what they all said, oh, look, the wife wanted a cocktail cabinet. But that was also what they kept. And that was what still had pride of place. Yeah. And I think that, you know, that, that's, I think, a nice example of what were they doing for themselves and things that can actually quite different and often quite fancier than some of the work they were doing at home as well. Yeah. It'd be interesting to know whether they were taking materials home well, with them. Yes, so, yes. I mean, yes, it becomes a, a subversive thing in many different ways. Yes, definitely.
went to India, I studied language in Udaipur, and wanted to go see um, you know, people making cloth in Udaipur, and they said, no, it's not traditional enough because you have to go to Jaipur. So I went to Jaipur, mm -hmm. and when I got to Jaipur, they said, no, you can't really, you can't really study it here, you have to go to Sangamir. And then Sangamir said, no, we've just recently started doing screen prints, you have to go to Labru. And nobody told me to go anywhere else once I got to Labru, and so I stayed there. <laughs> <laughs> So what does craftsmanship mean? It's one connoisseurship is one thing, which is also very important. You know, I don't I don't shy away from that at all. And and when you start looking at objects and, and determining um, their uh, not just their value, but um, their, them in a hierarchy between others, you realize that craftsmanship is important. And then what does that mean? And that's why I am um, in that. What what does craftsmanship mean? And then. I realize that I don't know because I don't know who made these things. Or I don't know. It's, a, it's a kind of a vicious <coughs> cycle, but craftsmanship is important, and we'll see where that takes us. Well, my, my answer would be very similar to Namita's, actually. It's, it's really, uh, it allows me to call to attention sites and forms of work and dimensions of work and actors who are rendered invisible. In my case, it didn't last a minute of technology. Same, but almost same. Uh, the craft, I mean, some people might be saying it isn't, but very much uh, for me, it helps me to think about these practices of making that often fall out of the institutional definition of either design or craft. So, certain practice of making that tends to be ordinary or you know, non craft design. So, part of my work has been I've been doing extensive interviews with a group of people who, who repair fishing boats or returning to Europe. And these are people who the boat making is their family business uh, because of transnational fishing companies on the west coast of Africa. So they cannot make boat for fishing anymore, but they repurpose this boat in terms of you know, you make them because you need a different boat, you need a different capacity, you know, if you want to get to Canary Island or you want to do this, you cannot use the same fishing boat. So to think about this you know, migration politics or these practices of movement or the way people claim the right to movement uh, through the lens of making, then it, it makes me uh, able to think about what I call the, the technical mode of um, critique of borders. So the material mode of critique of borders that these people kind of practice. So that's how it can help me think. Can I ask a follow-up question? Obviously, in the United States, and what's going on here right now, but in other places where there are camps that were supposed to be there for three years, five years, and are now there for, for 30 years, right? So there are generations that are being born, raised, raising their children in these environments, right? Where is the study of craft and new traditions and um, material practices? I'd be curious across 
study of such, but maybe because these camps are, even though it's the, you know, they're 30 years, they still operate as a camp. One of the problem with camps that it does no matter if now, I mean, people calling these camps now, or we should think of them as camp cities, right? They are cities. But they are not sitting in the Jewish camps of the police. They are, they are very much a police in the state. So one of the problem of camps is that often tends, no matter if there are all the camps, as you said, it's been put up emergency, but tends to be permanent. And one of the reasons they become permanent is through actually humanitarian practices and humanitarian design. You know, once you, you design a new shelter, that's of course you stay for 10 years, you, you automatically you know, make it permanent. And that means that camp often doesn't allow for political subjectivity. So then the camp, Michel Ayer, he's an anthropology has written a lot about camp, and he says, basically, he quotes one of the uh, Medicine Sans Frontier uh, aid work and says the camp doesn't need democracy to function. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that tells a lot about what kind of possibilities, you know, I look for people to, you know, practice in camps, you know, become like that practice. But I know, you know, philanthropists been doing this, ITR for example, now they put in you know, this idea of enter social entrepreneurship in the camp in Jordan. Mm -hmm. Uh, very problematic, right? I mean, you don't know what kind of labor protections you're going to have, but people are going to produce crafty objects for IKEA in the camp in Jordan. Uh, and, and it's been celebrated, of course, because, you know. Yeah. When, and many of these places do end up with their own economy, right? And so, and there's there's making involved in that in the same way, you know, um, people are returning phones and, um, mm -hmm. you know, these, these small cell phone places mm -hmm all over in, um, you know, well, unquote, temporary, um, you know, spaces. Um, so there is, there is making involved in there, and we are studying, you know, the sort of um, uh, economy of these kind of places, but not, I don't think, um, in a way that really brings out the idea of craft. Mm. I think we almost have to have distance in terms of, you know, think about the Japanese internment camp in yeah, World exactly. War II, you know, that's been one of the few places Self-settlement jungle, or something. But uh, I mean, French police tore down the camp, but it was an economy going on. And people put up barber shops, you know, restaurants, you know, cafe, and all these things, and, and they came up to build things themselves. Uh, this go, goes back to this idea. Of, I don't know if anyone familiar with Shiro Gopal, a famous humanitarian architect, has won a lot of awards, but recently created three reviews. The, the, the typical UNHCR tent that we know today, that's used in lots of designed by him and to all lots of awards. Uh, but there is an interesting story behind that in terms of craftsmanship that uh, first time um, the refugee Rwanda, Rwanda, refugees from Rwanda uh, in, in a camp in Gimbele, they, they, they were given um, uh, textiles and iron pipe. Iron pipe as the structure and textile as, as the roof for the shelter. But what happened that these refugees ended up selling these iron pipes in the nearby market to gain some uh, you know, dependency on their financial situation and they start cutting down trees, right, to, to make the structure. UNHCR found this problematic because UNHCR argued this leads to defor deforestation of the camp. Why the deforestation started when UNHCR decided to make the camp there, right? <laughs> so it was a question of who has the agency to deforest. And, and in Shiro Gopal, the UNHCR designer, come with the idea of um, using cardboard pipe, right? Uh, something that people could not sell, something that people could not do anything to maintain it. control. Yeah. So this is, and this is celebrated humanitarian design project. So again, how much of this design, you know, take over the agency of those people who, I mean, they figured out their own design and how to present it. I think we have time for one more question. Catherine, you have the microphone. Yeah, I do. Um, 
Uh, actually, just to follow up on that, uh, recently the Design History Society had their uh, conference here in New York on, on design displacement. There was a very, very interesting presentation about uh, Japanese um, temporary shelters um, and uh, comparing and contrasting those which were metal prefab versus those that were based on wooden joinery systems and that actually could be dismantled and relocated um, versus the metal ones that could not. Um, my question is, I was really interested in the, the way you all were talking about these questions of authorship and collaboration, uh, and I'm wondering if you could talk some more about, uh, in your own practice, uh, one of the things that we found in putting together the symposium is we really wanted to focus on different disciplines, but how those disciplines practice their scholarship, and how what curation is, and what photography is, and, and Steve, you mentioned your, your co-author, uh, who's here today, you can talk a little bit about how that, how actually is your own scholarship practice and formed, and how that's impacted by essentially the structures or disciplines that you work with. Yeah, Steve, you want In what dimensions? Like, like, how we go about doing our scholarship, like yeah. the craft of our, yeah. our craft itself. Um, well, my, the, for me, the field that would be relevant would probably be more SPF and information science, because information science is this completely weird grab bag. Although it's, it's a fascinating cross-section to sit at, because and this comes up all the time around everything we do in, in review for colleagues for tenure or promotion or things like that. You find out that the metrics are wildly different, and the forms of work are wildly different between the fields, and that's why they're all um, so my, I guess my sense of scholarly craft really comes from more from the science and technology studies world, it's sort of my core grounding I would say. Um, it's been inflected in interesting ways by moving into an information science environment which has a much more robust uh, collaborative culture and co-authorship culture. So now almost everything I do is actually co-authored, it's been many, probably It's a funny situation and it causes problems actually sometimes when you come up, when, when, when I encounter my old disciplinary norms, because in my, under my old disciplinary norms, that looks kind of weird, right? Like, well, what does that mean that you co-author and what does that mean? I don't understand who did the work, how do you have that? Um, but for me, it's been a deeply, for me, that's been like the great joy of doing what I do is to work with lots of different people. Uh, I think a lot about the craft of writing that's a key dimension of the work that I do that I think is very craft-like in nature. And, I, and in fact, one of the reasons that I collaborate so prolifically and in particular with students is because that's really, collaboration has really been the best way I know to transmit the craft of writing. Um, writing a paper together is kind of like uh, a form of apprenticeship or collaboration in which, you know, the old model that I grew up under was But actually getting down to the level of the sentence and saying, this word needs to go there. There's one word out of place where that word has to be moved. Is for me, crucial to the craft of writing and shaping the, the nature of the piece. So for me, that's just been kind of a lucky discovery. It wasn't really in my own background and training. It's not really how I was trained as a grad student. But it's become um, central and a great joy, really. Not always a joy. Amy's, Amy's laughing. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, for me, it's been wonderful. Amy can give you the facts. <laughs> I work alone, unfortunately. <laughs> 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 on this project, I have a 
curator and curators, we do, I do a lot of collaborations there, but working alone, and that's a problem. Um, I, but for this project, I'm so territorial about it. <laughs> I'm gonna continue to finish it. No, really, I am, but, um, but uh, I think it's, there, there are issues with that, but I guess we're working that traditional model for the moment. I was just gonna follow up on that because um, that's what I do is ethnography, and um, it's built into the sort of post-colonial history of anthropology to, um, to be reflexive and to understand that authorship, um, that, that object, objectifying is built into the grammar of authorship, right? So I write about you objectifies the thing that you write about immediately just in the grammar. And so how do you, to, um, so, so the first thing is really to kind of just own that, that, that um, authorship is a form of object, objectification on its own and it's built into it. Um, I do a lot of writing with other people and collaborative writing. I have not written with informants yet because that has been um, nearly impossible. But one of the other ways that anthropologists try to mediate that idea is that um, if I write about you, it's written into the object, objectification is written into the grammar, then we also write about ourselves. And so we often get criticism for putting ourselves into the story, but it is in fact um, a, a, a kind of a reply to that question to put yourself then also into the story um, with the people that you're talking about as well. I collaborate in a number of different ways. Um, and some of them are really hard, <laughs> which speaks to you know, the, the question of you know, collaborations are not always even all the time. Um, I, I have a writing partner um, that I write a lot of work with, Benjamin Lanyell. We're working on a project on gender and jewelry, and we actually are working with our subjects. We've done interviews with a number of people um, about gender and adornment, and we wrote comments and questions. We've exchanged those with the subjects, and we've given them the, uh, uh, the authority to remove things, to revise things, to add things to reply to them, and then eventually that is going to be published in um, some kind of an open platform combined with some kind of a book. Um, <coughs> we're still debating because, you know, <coughs> money. Um, so once we figure out, out all the details, that will come through in some other way. But, but the idea is to try to, um, to push back on, on this idea of objectification and to allow people to have a back and forth. Um, I, I don't, I can't really think of very many things that I have written that I have not sent to my baby caterpillar in the wings that I sent things to on various occasions and asked for feedback and comments and questions. Um, I, I, don't, I don't like to work alone. I like to step back and think alone and process and then put it back out there and test. Um, and I think in some ways, uh, maybe this is why curatorial work was, was particularly exciting for me is because it's a way of applying ideas and interacting and it's very, um, it satisfies the extra, extrovert that wants to um, engage people and input or process it. But um, I also try to be very sensitive to naming who, my, um, who I, I work with in, in different ways. So ultimately I would say that the, the essay is signed by me because I did the writing, but I always mention the people who I talked to or who um, sent me feedback and that the story needs to go there. <laughs> a lot of times it's my sister, but she's a, she's a brutal editor. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, but it, you need to have, a, I think you have to have a couple of people that you trust to give your, your work to and to bounce ideas off of, otherwise um, you're just moving these prizes that are taking power from you. At some point, you know, you share things in different ways. You have conversations. Oh, I so share a lot. Yeah. I work with that for editing, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I do collaborate a lot, though the question is, because the question is, Maybe not necessarily all of them would go to like an academic level, or 
write an article because whether we like it or not, it, it's an informant or people collaborate. If they're not academics, you already have this inequality power relationship, right? You like the language I use, you know, the term, the concept, the way uh, I structure, you know, my argument, it's the person from that term. So the question would be how that knowledge can be, that knowledge that came out of this collaboration can be communicated in a different format that those people are more comfortable with. So that now i uh, trying to do, you know, like the kind of more artistic books and visual books on old pictures of Sumangyo. And there it's, it's based on different craft workshops that document. So, uh, so so then, you know, because then it's a different sort of relationship with, with the other producers and that. So I think it's a question of thinking of different formats and different platforms um, so that can do that. And then it comes to the disciplinary and then the, the type of work I do is impossible uh, if I would not talk to other disciplines, right? Anthropology and, 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 and critical Gordon studies and so on and so forth. So without them, I mean, design is not critical. It's just about form, about the issues. Uh, but not even interested in this, in this, in this form either. So, so it's necessary 